So I'd like to thank you all for coming to this great session. Um, I'd like to introduce Matt Olsen, our presenter. Um, Matt Olsen is a senior financial consultant with ACR. He specializes in funding and financing sources and strategies for transit and infrastructure plans at the local, regional, as well as state levels. His experience includes cost-benefit analysis, assessing project viability using federal criteria, policy development and analysis, and high-speed rail implementation. He has assisted on several successful grant applications, resulting in over 200 million in funding for clients. Um, and I just want to um, pre um, present Matt from a personal perspective. I was looking for presenters for this conference, and we really wanted something on grant writing. And I recently went to a conference, a national conference, and I, this is literally what happened. We sat down, Matt started talking, and I said to the person I was with, that's who I want. Because so often, with especially with these subjects, it can be a little boring, right? Uh, Matt is not boring, but he's to the point, he's very clear, he's easily understood, and I want him here. So I'm very grateful to him, but I'm especially uh, grateful to his organization that donated his time, travel, to be here. So I'm very, very happy to present Matt Olsen. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you so much. Hard to follow that introduction, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Uh, like I said, my name is Matt Olson, and I'm happy to talk with you guys today about grants, all things funny, and how we can try to help leverage uh, your applications going forward. I'm going to be focusing primarily on federal applications, but there are a lot of tips that you can use with uh, some of the state applications as well, in terms of trying to highlight your projects and um, <laughs> try to draw attention on the benefits then uh, of the different projects you're seeking funding for. So we're going to be talking about today some of the grant opportunities at the federal level that are currently available. We're going to talk a little bit about grant strategy. Then we're going to go into specific tips for successful narratives when it comes to those applications. And then I'll provide my contact information at the end. <clears throat> so talking about federal grants, some of the benefits and challenges. Benefits clearly, it's additional funding. It can help you close that project gap and it allows then some of your local and regional money to be used for other projects. However, I do want to highlight that there are challenges in working with the federal government. It does federalize the project and you're subject to federal regulations. Um, also, just because you've won an award does not necessarily mean it's an easy path to obligation. Uh, right now, for example, we're working with some clients in Washington where they had won an award and it was announced they won an award over a year ago and we're still waiting on the terms and conditions for that particular grant. That can be a very scary point because you may have said your project costs were going to be at a certain element but as we all know project costs are continuing to escalate and while we're waiting then for USDOT or FTA, FHWA or FRA um, the costs are continuing to escalate and the contractors are just kind of sitting and waiting and materials are getting more expensive. So something to consider when you're going for a federal grant. As well as the additional reporting requirements with either quarterly or monthly reports that you have to complete and that specific delivery deadline. But it's a really cool and exciting time to be part of infrastructure and transportation. With IIJA, um, the Investing in American Jobs Act, or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act, there are historic investments right now when it comes to roads and bridges, passenger rail, from energy, broadband, water resiliency. It's a very exciting time. I will add, though, what we've noticed at the federal level is, is that like I was saying before, the federal government's a little bit slow in terms of trying to deliver investments and funding. With that then, they're combining fiscal years into one NOFO. So they might combine funding from fiscal year 23 and fiscal year 24, then into a single notice of funding opportunity. That can be great because there's more money that's out there to be um, given for potential projects. However, if your project isn't ready, it might mean you're going to rush the application, which can also be dangerous then when you're trying to apply and you're competing with um, different agencies all across the nation. So some uh, funding opportunities that are expected in the next six months, 
Um, NOFO, short for that Notice of Funding Opportunity. We have the uh, open right now, the Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhood Access and Equity Grant. That was combined. Um, it's a really great opportunity, uh, especially if you're serving disadvantaged communities. We also have the FTA Transit Oriented Development Pilot Program and USDOT SMART. Upcoming NOFOs include the Bridge Investment Program, the FRA Railroad Crossing Elimination Program, and USDOT RAISE. Um, there are plans that we've heard from USDOT that they do plan to release RAISE by October. However, um, if there's a government shutdown uh, at the federal level, that's likely to be pushed out. And that's also something to consider too with these uh, notice of funding opportunities. Um, so at HDR, we do offer a number of education information summaries. Uh, we have summaries of all different programs um, at the, the federal level, in some cases at the state level. I'm not really here to sell or pitch you on that, but I will kind of pitch you guys all on this. Everybody has these types of websites and everybody has this information. We're gonna go through some of the summaries that HDR has developed, but I'm sure ACOM has this, WSP has this, Jacobs has this. So if you're looking for free resources, absolutely, you can go to um, um, APTA, the American Public Transportation Association. They're a great resource, but also the different architecture, architecture, excuse me, and engineering firms, they have these free resources. And it's great, they're updating it really quick. Um, they're concise and to the point, and I would definitely encourage you all um, Take a look at that. It's free. And that's them trying to advertise their services like we do at HDR. And they also have webinars as well, um, as does then USDOT or FRA, Federal Railroad uh, Administration or the Federal Highway Administration. So this is an example of some of the fact sheets and we'll go through a specific, uh, two th specific ones later in the presentation. But as I said, all of the firms are doing this. They're highlighting the application deadlines. They're highlighting the breakdown of these grants, how it's split between this one here uh, on a planning side or others if it's construction or implementation. So talking about grant strategy, I can't say enough um, preparing for grants. If you start responding to a grant when the notice of funding opportunity drops, you're a little late on the game. It's almost similar to on the consulting or the private sector side, we would say if the RFP hits the street for a request or proposal of services with uh, a client or an agency, you're already too late. You're losing that pre-positioning, you're losing the preparation, and really that's key with a, um, a notice of funding opportunity looking for a grant. You really need to put in the preparation and really highlight what we say at HDR, the readiness, the eligibility, and the merit then of these different projects. And data analysis, like it says, oh, looks like I need to hide that so you guys can see it, is a centerpiece. And that's also the benefit cost analysis as well as using then federal data on um, disadvantaged communities and aligning with the Justice 40 initiatives, which we'll also be talking about later in the presentation. <clears throat> so we have this approach at HDR, but really it should be any general approach when it comes to screening for different projects and prioritizing them when you're going after a grant. I've had some clients ask, well, does it make sense to go after multiple projects with one grant opportunity? You could, absolutely, but it might confuse the federal reviewers on what's your real priority and what are you really trying to seek that funding for. So <clears throat> we have a tool at HDR, um, but really I think anyone can do this using their capital program or their capital budget and identifying the different projects. What do you want to seek funding for? What, um, where are they at? What's their eligibility when it comes to specific programs? And where are they at when it comes to project development and the funding status? A lot of the grants require a 20% minimum match. So that's kind of another burden when it goes for a federal funding opportunity. Do you have 20% to close that match? Is it something you can talk to your partners at the state level for closing it? Um, and where are you at with project development? Are you just at the planning level? Are you seeking construction? Are you what we would say shovel ready within the next 18 to 24 months? And that's all stuff federal reviewers are looking at. <clears throat> In terms of eligibility, if you've got a railroad crossing project, you might not wanna go after you know, the bridge program. 
but really it is, is it, it's mapping out all of your projects and taking a look at them and what are the attributes of my projects and then showing and taking a look at then funding opportunities of I have a railroad crossing that I want to address in my community. That might be an FRA program. If it's a bridge, that might be something through USDOT. It might also be something through the Highway Administration. And the merit criteria, we'll talk a little bit more on that with the breakdowns of the different programs and then prioritizing those different projects. And I'll also be, ah, excuse me, I'll be providing a copy of all my slides to Tracy at the end and um, she can disseminate and distribute out to you all. So some of the readiness factors that I was talking about is the scope of your project. You have a defined scope. Um, what are you trying to solve? What's the purpose of the project? And that's really key and having that identified, really being able to speak to that and, and um, be able to craft a narrative around that is one of the most important factors when it comes to going for a federal grant. Where are you at with the NEPA or the environmental status? Um, What's the project schedule look like? Have we plotted that out as well? Budget is a key thing also. If you're in the planning level, um, that's a little bit easier to work at because you're still developing those ideas. But if you're going for construction, um, a construction track or construction money, they're really gonna wanna see that project breakdown. They're gonna wanna see breakdowns for material. They're gonna wanna see breakdowns for um, certain construction tasks. And they're also gonna wanna see your contingency. What funding has been identified and committed at a local level or at a regional level? Is it in the regional transportation plan? Is it something that the agency has worked on in their capital improvement plan? Um, what type of public engagement has been done? Have you been talking with the local communities? Yes, sir. Question over here. Oh, oh sorry. yes, ma'am, excuse me. I would say, and we're going to talk a little bit about it later as well, why, what the benefits are and for that specific community. That should really go to it. Um, how are you serving the constituents? How is it going to impact those local communities? And just because your community isn't necessarily disadvantaged, you can still write to their economic burdens that my community is facing, even though we're not considered low income or um, one of the, the factors that the White House has marked. If you can convey that and say, this is really how we're advancing um, transportation initiatives in our local community, that's what they want to see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I might be talking to heads on maybe you're being a contractor and all. So how costly is it for, so in this organization, do you have some organizations uh -huh. like ours, like or you might be the county, you might have the resources to do all these things and environmental status, all these things. Yeah. But for these smaller organizations or outlying areas, they don't have those resources. So I worry that they may get intimidated of like, oh, we can't apply for that even though we might have something that would be great because I don't even know what it means that it's, let alone that a cow would be, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So yeah. How, how costly is it? How reasonable can you get a con? company like yours just do pieces of it? Do you have to do the whole thing? Is it very costly? Can that be included in the grant? Does it have to be paid for separately? Could you answer that just a little bit? So yeah. Well so no, 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 that's a great question. Um, grants can be costly, absolutely. And we'll talk about that with, um, are you familiar with the benefit cost analysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I would say, is where it gets really expensive, is when you're paying for the economist's time. Um, I'd like to think anyone can, can write a grant. It, it's really just, it seems like it's this mysterious thing, right, about grant writing, but really it's just persuasive writing. And it's something that they don't teach us in school. So I did a master's in public policy and public administration. We never talked about grants. And that was really disappointing. But really what it is is it's persuasive writing. And to me, there's no better writer of a grant than the local person. You can write a grant way better than I can in terms of telling how, that, how federal funding or how state funding is really going to advance your community. 
I can take a look at all of the data points for your local community at the uh, federal level with census data. Um, I could visit, but there's nothing like you really conveying the heart and the energy then into your application. Um, when a notice of funding opportunity comes out, they do have a lot of guidelines or breakdowns on what they want to see in the application. Um, and that definitely gets to kind of the eligibility or where you're at then with your application. Or taking then um, some of those fact sheets from different companies like a WSP or an HDR like ours and kind of writing to that. And the federal government will say how they want it breaking down. Um, you're right, the cost burden can get really expensive. What I might suggest if I was in a smaller community's shoes is, is um, talking with kind of your uh, neighboring agencies or at the state level and asking if they have resources to maybe QA, QC your application. That might be one. Um, a lot of small businesses will also um, do grant writing. Um, a lot of kind of public agents or um, public affairs type groups or outreach groups also do grant applications. And that might be a little bit more cost effective than going with a bigger, you know, an HDR or a WSP of sorts. But where it does get dicey again is on the benefit cost analysis. And that's then where you're taking your project and you're showing how the cost of your project, and I have a couple slides in here later, is going to look and the benefits over a 30 or 50 year period. That for the most part is a trained economist. There are free resources out there. Um, if I'm being candid, I'm very disappointed that USDOT has never put out their own tool to use for a benefit cost analysis. Um, I'm based out of California. Uh, Caltrans has a free tool that they do give to local agencies and it's called CalBCA, just C-A-L-B-C-A. And what's cool about that tool is, is they have their uh, economic models built for a um, active transportation project. So it could be something with pedestrians. It could be something with a bridge. It could be rail. It could be highway. It could be transit. It could be bus focused. And they have different models where you're just kind of inputting things in. And then you're seeing what your project looks like. Um, when I've been, oh, yes, sir. Anyone can use that? Or is it just Anyone can use that. CalBCA? CalBCA. C-A-L-B-C-A. Yeah. It's a free resource that the uh, state of California offers. When I've um, cornered USDOT or FRA um, employees at different conferences or on a debrief, and I've pushed them to that, if they're pushed in a corner, they'll say use CalBCA as a resource. But for now, I haven't seen any. Um, another opportunity you could use is, is going to University of Utah or maybe your local higher education institutions and asking them if they would partner with you on that because all of the economic students, they have to do this. And this could be great practical work, you know, instead of doing a BCA for Storyville and they're building a new rail line, you could go to the universities and ask them, hey, go to the economics department. We really need help with our benefit cost analysis. Would you be able to take a look at that? Yes, sir. Yeah. All of the applications require these fees, ones like RAISE, INFRA, what other ones do, but most of the Federal Transit Administration ones don't, you know, a lot of others don't. So yeah, that is great. And um, I know the Capital Investment Grant Program, they have their own kind of tool that they use for that, but that's pretty easy, excuse me, it's not easy to fill out, but they have their own tool to fill out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not want to say that that's an easy tool, but... Um, yeah, some of the, the federal programs, if it's tied to construction, more likely than not, they're going to want a benefit cost analysis. But at the planning level, um, usually they're pretty lenient with that. So some of the eligibility screening that I was talking about before, identifying the project, if it's for rail, if it's a bridge, if it's a grade separation or active transportation, trying to kind of nail down. Like I was saying before, Maybe you're not going to go for, if it's a bike pedestrian type project, you're not necessarily looking at an aviation um, type program. But plotting that out and having kind of a, maybe like an Excel workbook or a spreadsheet or a database where you've created different fields and for your projects, 
what would be the likely federal agency that you'd be working with? And that's kind of a good way of boiling down then your different funding programs. So some of the merit criteria, this is what they're looking for in those notice of funding opportunities. They're looking for how does your project address safety issues? Um, equity now is a, is a key component. Um, the Justice 40 initiative, uh, are we all familiar or have we all heard of the Justice 40 initiative? So trying to get money out to disadvantaged communities, that's a key thing now in every grant application. Want to see that. But just because, again, and we'll take a look at some tools that the federal government offers in terms of looking at disadvantaged communities, just because it's not explicitly one doesn't mean that you can't speak to equity. Climate change and resiliency is a key one. There's opportunities now with the um, Federal Emergency Management Agency's BRIC, or the Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities program is a great one. Mobility. Um, freight is also a key one. If you have rail crossings or freight lines going through your community, it might be, um, I would say this. I've noticed that the class one railroads now are more active in engaging with smaller communities if you have rail crossings through your state. They're looking to try to address those rail crossings and they see federal dollars as kind of free money. And in some cases, they're going to smaller communities and saying, hey, we'll pay for the grant application, but we want you to put your name on it and we'll work with, with you as partners to address any rail crossings in your communities. Um, taking a look at the extent geographically, um, funding alignment, this is a key thing. Do you have a 20% match? That's what the, Fed, the feds are always looking for. That's one of the first things they're looking at. Do you have that opportunity for match? Um, partnering, it could be, I think you mentioned you were from a smaller community, right? If you're partnering with other local neighboring communities, they really like that as well. I've seen that. And it's more than just a support letter, it's also showing that financial commitment. And while maybe one smaller jurisdiction can't close that 20% gap, maybe a few other jurisdictions can as well or engaging with the state or any, um, the county or other levels of government then to try to close that. And then of course, household and jobs impact. Um, the Cal BCA model, they also have, if you put in the cost of your project and the amount of years as well as some other details, they'll give you a rough estimate at the number of job years then generated from your project. Benefit cost analysis. Um, <clears throat> Really what it's looking at is, is for every dollar that I spend, how much money am I going to get over a 30 or a 50 year period? And some of the key impacts that they're looking at is, is traffic. Are we reducing traffic? Are we including more users or riders then on our system? Um, are we reducing then crashes or um, uh, emissions is a big key. And these are all things you can plug in with that Cal BCA tool. Again, it's a great resource. And really what they're looking for is a magic number of one. So for every dollar spent, do I get at least a dollar in economic impacts back? I've seen on awards and on other projects I've worked on, with rural communities, they are much more lenient on the BCA. And they understand that it's a little bit harder to quantify those impacts and that you might not get that marker for every dollar spent you're going to get a dollar fifty in economic benefits then over that time period. You know, it's harder sometimes in a rural community to compare to building a new rail line, for example, in New York City. But I found federal reviewers are much more lenient, and in fact, in a lot of the notice of funding opportunities, most times they'll include a carve away for rural communities, and they'll say that there is a certain amount of funding um, from the general pot that's available that is specific to a rural community. So that's great as well that then you're not competing against a New York MTA or Chicago or Dallas or San Francisco. <clears throat> so looking at then, this is some kind of high level information for the BCAs, um, trying to take a look at the different benefit categories. They have information and resources on um, the federal uh, I think it's on USDOT's website on how to calculate this. I think personally it's a bit dense and I've even gotten a little tired reading it. So my best bet is, is play around with the Cal BCA models or if there are other free BCA models, take a look at that. Maybe engage again with your local economics department or other additional 
additional resources. I think, sir, you mentioned a bank helped you guys out with the BCA. That's another resource you guys could use as well because um, it can get very technical and it's great to then be able to pull into different resources with that. But again, generally, they're looking for um, the BCAs if you're going for construction. And here it is um, kind of mapped out here with the costs over time, the benefits, and um, taking a look at then when the, you're comparing in a BCA the no build scenario, which would be if I don't build the project, how is life going to continue and what additional costs are going to be incurred um, whether that's emissions or continued accidents. And then we compare it to then when the project opens, how have those benefits then um, increased then over time with reduced accidents or uh, reduced then emissions. So I was talking a little bit about, we have a REM tool that we use at HDR where we'll take our clients um, capital programs and we put it in our tool and we compare it then to different um, funding opportunities at the federal level. We can also do this at a state level. Um, really, I, if I was to kind of give you guys a tip, I would take a snapshot of this and I would highlight with the readiness score, what our readiness scores are. So I was talking about before is, is, is the project on a regional plan? Have we committed funding? Have we done some project development to advance the project? So done public outreach or done some environmental work and could construction begin in the next 24 months? Um, I would put that in your capital programs. These are really key things to help you identify then, is this project ready to go for a federal grant? In terms of merit scores, we were talking a little bit about this before as well. This could just be a manual check then for yourselves. Does this project address community connectivity? Um, is it addressing a safety issue? Is it addressing um, economic vitality or disadvantaged or underserved communities? And this is a good way then for you to break down what the different attributes of your projects are. And then you can take that and you can look then at different fund um, funding opportunities. But to your point too, some of the tools that we've built or that a WSP or a Jacobs will build um, they can be a little bit pricey, but this is a great way to kind of outline within your own capital programs then um, how to achieve this and how to look at then federal funding opportunities. Any questions on this so far? No? Perfect. <clears throat> preparing, preparing, preparing. Um, when a notice of funding opportunity comes out, again, you're, you're late on the game. Anytime though I do start a grant opportunity or any grant work, um, you definitely want to make sure your SAM.gov is uh, working, your grants.gov account is working. Um, usually we'll do weekly or maybe sometimes twice a week calls on the progress of a grant. Every time I jump on the call, I always ask, is your grants.gov account working? Um, you don't want to be the day the grant is due trying to submit. <laughs> your account doesn't work. You're locked out. And I can tell you, um, IT at USDOT, IT at FTA, IT at FRA, when they know a grant is due, I'm pretty sure they leave at 2 o'clock that day. <laughs> yep. Yep. And you probably can't even find them at the DC bars. So... They're just hiding at home with the lights all turned off and uh, yeah. So you really want to turn in anything ahead of time early if possible. But prior to the um, uh, notice of funding opportunity dropping, you're going to want to evaluate your projects like we were saying before. Is it ready? Is it shovel ready in the next 24 months? Do we have funding committed? You're going to want to take a look at political support. Have you talked with your elected officials? In some cases, <clears throat> Um, the benefit cost analysis might be really low and it might seem like a project isn't as strong but if you have elected official support either from your um, uh, congress members or from your senators or even your locally elected officials that really does make a difference I can't say that enough um, a good point in your narrative you could include a quote from elected officials then about that specific project 
And then developing a grant appli application team and workflow, we'll talk a little bit about this. And then while you're working on the application, you're going to be one, writing the grant narrative, adjusting your BCA. Graphic design is key. These reviewers, they like to see bright pictures. So really include pictures of your project. Um, if you're doing a, I know I keep coming back to it, a rail crossing, maybe show a line of cars that are all behind that rail crossing. Or if you're trying to increase services, maybe show a picture or stage a photo of a bunch of people waiting for the bus to come. But pictures and graphic design are key. That's what they really want to see. <clears throat> so some specific tips and critical roles in grant preparing. You're going to want to have a local champion. This is going to kind of be the project manager um, who's then really pulling everyone together. Because when you go for a grant, it is really an agency-wide exercise. Everybody should be touching it. And it's not necessarily that the agency head is reviewing it at the end. Um, really getting a schedule and defining then within the application who's your grant manager. They're going to want to know that. <clears throat> who's the writer? Um, who's your graphic designer? Um, who's going to be reviewing it from a technical side? And then on the political liaison, who's getting the support letters? And who's reaching out to your elected officials then um, to support the project? In terms of the grant writer, I know it does say that previous federal grants experience is important. This is a great way, though, to engage younger staff. I was a young staff member, and they asked me, hey, can you write a grant? Because people, I guess, were too busy or they weren't as interested in it. And it got me really passionate about it. And it really forced me to learn about the project and learn about then that key role of funding and how the grant kind of pulls everything together. Because you have your engineers who are going to be talking about the cost estimates and the, you know, the technical spe specifications of a project. Then you have your planners who are looking at the schedules. You have your cost estimators. But for a, a young staffer or trying to get someone involved, um, it's a really cool opportunity to learn about what the agency's doing and how a project kind of is holistic from all sides. It, I, I can't say that enough. It got me hooked. And my pitch when I do this presentations is trying to get more people to do grants. Um, I really think while HDR and other firms, you have your KPMGs and such, who we offer grant writing services, this really is something um, it's not scary, I promise. It's something that it's accessible and other people can do, and it's just writing to then the federal criteria. And if we get young folks interested and involved, then um, they'll continue to get other people involved. It's not, I, I try to demystify it, because to me it's, it's not scary, it can be kind of fun in terms of selling your project and really um, you know, advocating for your community and the benefits then of that project. <coughs> So some tips and tricks we have for grant success, um, some of the stuff I've mentioned already, um, engaging with your elected officials in Congress and in the Senate, uh, being clear, what is my project, what are the benefits of it, and who does it benefit? Um, when it comes to the good presentation and themes, um, it goes hand in hand with that bullet underneath it with uh, including maps, texts, graphics on showing these are the benefits of my project, instead of it just being one long essay. Um, <clears throat> not letting the environmental delay schedule. Sometimes we can't control that with the environmental progress and the environmental reports. But at least being candid with looking to the federal government as a partner on the environmental review, piece, on the environmental review side is really important. And then making sure then with the project um, when we say fitting the grant criteria, making sure again that the ask is in line with the agency and in line with the agency's goals for that particular program. So if it's, um, if you were going to go for funding under the Federal Emergency Management uh, Associations, the, the BRIC program, you really want to talk about resiliency and how is this project going to help advance um, sustainable efforts or in the case of either a wildfire or other natural disasters, how is it going to help um, kind of prepare then in those cases and mitigate then some of the issues with that. <clears throat> so again, in terms of executing a grant application, I can't say enough. It's a really cool opportunity to engage and enable junior staff. 
Um, it's an agency-wide exercise. Everyone should be working on this. Um, we'll take a look at some of the application requirements when we take a look at a fact sheet, but really making sure you're writing to all elements. Um, personally, a schedule for getting the review done with the uh, narrative. I would say three weeks before it's due, you should be looking at a first draft. And then giving your reviewers three days to review. After that, turning around a second draft, and maybe that second draft is where you're looking at then the graphics, and you're adding the maps, and you're adding then images. And then I'd say you should be done, hopefully, two to three days then before, it's, uh, before the NOFO closes. And then taking a look at, again, then with your grant application, the Justice 40 initiative and the socioeconomic burdens. So I'm going to, oh, and then some pitfalls as well. Uh, USDOT doesn't want you to just rely on the BCA. Try to take a look at other data elements. So taking a look at the Census Bureau and census data about your different com communities and how it can benefit it. And trying to highlight then the key points either in an image, in a graphic, with bullets, with a call out box, um, so it doesn't just read like an essay. I'm going to pull up my screen here and we're going to take a look at some of the fact sheets we've developed. So this one is specifically for the safe streets and roads for all. So again, this is a free resource. Um, USDOT also has their own fact sheets that they'll put about these. Um, I'm happy to, after the presentation as well, I'll email a copy of these to Tracy and she can disseminate them. But <clears throat> here's what we outline and what other firms like at Jacobs or, NH or WSP will outline as well. First key thing, when is it due? And can I make that deadline? So this one was due back in July. What are the program objectives? So for the safe streets and roads for all, they're looking at promoting safety, low cost, uh, high impact strategies that are going to improve safety over that wider geographic area, equitable investments in um, underserved communities, and aligning then with equity and justice 40 as well as climate change and sustainability. So that's key. So we know now, okay, this is what this program is looking for. <clears throat> Eligible recipients, so who can go after this? A metropolitan planning organization, um, a political subdivision so of a state or territory, the tribes can go after this as well, or a regional joint uh, jurisdictional application. And states are not eligible applicants, so that'd be key, but um, they could work with then, eligible applicants are encouraged then to work with your state agency. So again, we've done the hard work of going through the NOFO then for you all, and or someone else has, and you can then start taking a look at then, at least at this high level, and then matching back to the document. <clears throat> so with this, like I was saying before, generally there's kind of two or three different tracks within a, a grant at the federal level. They're looking for either a planning uh, level type grant or they're looking for implementation, which would be tied most times to construction. So within this one, for this particular fiscal year, there are um, two different types of grant programs, the planning and the implementation. For the planning grants, they're looking for these key things. Leadership, planning structure, analysis, engagement, that would be outreach, equity considerations, and then progress and transparency. What are you going to do with the funds, the planning funds, and how much you're going to tell the federal grant that you'll need? Now a key thing also is on the award range. You have to hit a minimum amount and you have to be within the maximum amount. So the minimum amount of ask for this planning grant is 100,000. I think that that's reasonable. Most cases for a planning grant, I'm sure that that could exceed over, um, oh, excuse me. That could exceed over um, 100,000. But the maximum you could go for then would be 10 million. Now on the implementation on construction side, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting, I would say. And where you really have to do that kind of work up front in terms of looking at if your project is going to fall within those boundaries. So for an implementation or a construction type program with this particular NOFO, it's a minimum of two and a half million and a maximum of 25 million. And there's another element with this as well. With that match, if you got an award of 25 million 
you'd have to get 20% then of that 25 million as part of the match then on your own local level. So there's also that burden then as well is, is am I gonna be able to hit that match then to, um, for the anticipated award? We also have a breakdown here and most times they will as well on what they're looking for with the grant narrative. Um, for this case, they're only looking for 12 pages in length. I've also noticed they've been cutting down a lot on length um, with federal level uh, funding opportunities. And what's really cool right here, a benefit cost analysis is not required. So cool opportunity and then usually they'll have contact information then for whoever the organization's uh, kind of expert on that particular opportunity is. So if we look at raise, just out of curiosity, um, can you guys raise your hands if you guys are familiar with the RAISE program? All right. To me, and again, I'm going to be very candid on this, RAISE is one of the most competitive programs at the federal level. And I think it might be worth just going to Vegas and taking your match <laughs> and putting that on black or red and you might have better luck um, with success than you would with RAISE. Most race. Oh, Tracy, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. Congratulations. <laughs> How many times did it take you to submit? On one time or? Five. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say on average, um, most clients that I've worked with, it's been three to four. But um, raise is incredibly competitive. I try to tell people to not go for a raise grant application just because it can be a little bit expensive and it's a huge effort. Once you've done one though, would you say it was pretty easy reapplying then? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I, the BCA, as you mentioned, was by far the hardest. Um, yeah. 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 And trying to compete because previously uh, to uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Investing in, in um, Jobs Act, they didn't have a specific marker for the BCA. Now they're looking for you to get a 1.5. So for every dollar spent on your project, are you at least hitting then a dollar fifty in benefits over a 30, 50 year period? Yes, sir. Is that the same for transit as it is for road projects and things? Because in the past they said you could be lower than a On, on the rural side, yes. Um, I, I can't speak to every NOFO if they've said that on the transit side, but I know on the uh, w when it comes to a rural agency, um, they do make that case. Um, especially with the, um, the rural funding opportunity that just came out, they want to see a benefit cost analysis, but it doesn't have to make that 1.5 burden. Yes, sir. I don't know if this is kind of off topic or whatever, mm -hmm. but why is it so difficult to push public transportation in, in the U.S. in general. I mean, I was stationed overseas in multiple countries, and I mean, I hated coming back to the States because I had to drive myself. I had to freaking get a car, I had to get insurance. And it's like, Money. Um, I mean, but the cost analysis to the dividend that it pays back from a damn custodian an engineer, I mean, it's freaking amazing. I don't know, I see. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know what they don't see or what. I mean, it's tough at all levels. So I, um, especially with mega projects, when you look at like high-speed rail. So Tracy had mentioned I'd done high-speed rail. I worked on California high-speed rail for three years. And it just becomes sometimes, um, and again, I'm being very candid here, where there's just a lot of money spent on consultants. And a lot of money spent on consultants talking to other consultants and it gets too big and it yeah and it gets into this this issue of um, maybe there's not enough folks who've joined or want to work on the public side or want to go into public sector and then sometimes the private sector might take advantage of that and because there's so many vacancies then it's private sector embedded then in public sector staff and they're having to spend money on these private you know, sector experts to get you through it, like um, the NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act. 
there are so many experts on that, and I know enough to be dangerous with that process, but there are people who've spent their careers on it, and sometimes the policies will get so complex that then it takes an expert or it takes someone whose full-time job is, is just looking at that. And maybe an agency um, or that individual then doesn't want to work for an agency because there's more money than working on the private side. And that's kind of, um, so I studied public policy and public administration. That's kind of the sad side of it then is, is um, I really do have this belief in government and in local government and state government and trying to be able to advance projects and that there shouldn't be this over-reliance on consultants, but I am one, and <laughs> that's the identity crisis. <laughs> yes, sir. So I, I work for the Human Service Agency that serves people with disabilities. Uh -huh. It's not a transit agency, and so we're eligible to participate in the FTA's 5310 program, grant program. I'm wondering, as I was looking at the opportunities here, is there anything else that an organization like ours might pursue in terms of federal grants. Mm -hmm. um, and that there, I know maybe that's a question for you, UTA and other service agencies like ours. Uh, we, don't, we don't know what we don't know if there are other opportunities. Are there? Um, I, mean, you know. I think, <laughs> sir, do you have your hand up in the back? Part of that. Uh -huh. For two weeks, UDOT's hosting a federal discretionary grant here in change. So the, the short answer is yes. There's so many opportunities. The hard answer is it's like grades for the chase, right? but certainly there's but being tactical about which opportunities to work on can reap better benefits. The, the, the peer exchange is open and it's free. It's two days, the 19th and 20th. Um, we can work with you on registration. I know it's, it's still out there. Okay, it's being, it, it'll be held at the UDOT. Um, so, No, no, no. Th this is great. No, th this is great resources, and it's great accessible resources from the state as well that they can highlight the different priorities. APT is another op opportunity to look at them, the American Public Transportation Association, um, even going on grants.gov and putting in a little bit on your projects and trying to outline what's closed, what's open, and um, what's forthcoming. And, sir, you had your hand? Sorry, one, one more. Uh -huh. Saw your hand in the back.
need you to bring your projects and, and work with us to try to try to get those in the right one. So please join me up. Thank you. I wanted to spend the last couple minutes talking about the climate and economic justice screening tool as well as the equitable transportation community explorer. But the climate and justice screening tool, it's part of the Justice 40 initiative. It's used to identify disadvantaged communities, updated annually. It's separate from the Environmental Protection Agency's environmental justice screen. Um, some tips that I have when you're putting out a grant application is include screenshots from the tool in your grant applications and talk about percentiles that are close to or near um, that 90th percentile requirement in many cases. So even though your projected wildfire risk maybe isn't in the 90th percentile, what if it's in the 85th or in the 87th? And talking about it from that angle. So <clears throat> here's an example from the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. I apologize, it's a little blurry. Um, this particular census tract, where we're in right now, is identified as disadvantaged. Um, it's surrounded by tracks that are also considered disadvantaged. It meets the adjusted low income threshold. Um, there is an element of federally recognized tribal land. And it also notes that other factors in the area include projected wildfire risk. So putting this uh, screenshot in your grant application, I can't say enough. It really then shows federal reviewers. Uh, we considered this and this is why our project is going to um, help advance than the 40 initiative. Now, if it's not, I pulled this census tract, so this is north of St. George. Even though it's not explicitly identified as disadvantaged, I'd encourage you to go through, when you pull up this tool, it has the breakdowns then of different socioeconomic burdens, like you can see here. We have expected building loss rate, expected population loss rate, and projected wildfire risk. So even though it's not explicitly disadvantaged, being able to write to and hit on those socioeconomic burdens, I'd really encourage that as well. This is the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, CEJST. It's on the White House website. Anyone can use this. This is all public. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's a great way of then talking about then the neighboring jurisdictions in your project. That's a really good tip. Thank you. <clears throat> there is another tool, and it's called the Equitable Transportation Community Explorer. This is USDOT's specific um, augmentation of the um, Climate Economic Justice Screening Tool. So this is specifically looking at transportation disadvantages and they note transportation insecurity, a climate and disaster risk burden, um, environmental burden, as well as health and social vulnerabilities. Um, I use both tools when I'm writing a grant application and including screenshots and um, kind of talking about both. And again, even though a percentile isn't um, maybe kind of on that mark where it would hit then disadvantaged, being able to uh, write to it as well. So with this one, with the ETC, this is a screenshot of where we are right now, and it notes uh, using their tool, and if you use USDOT Equitable Transportation Community Explorer, it'll pop up. You can do a breakdown or a comparison of your census tract nationally or compared to the rest of the state. And here they're noting the percentile ranks then of this particular community when it comes to transportation insecurity. So taking a look at transportation access, transportation cost burden, and then traffic safety. And you can take a look at then those, the bars on the one on the top. Oh, and that's terribly blurry. I apologize. Mm -hmm. But um, when Tracy sends that out, you'll be able to see a little bit clearer of a breakdown on it. I apologize. But <clears throat> it's looking at those and being able to speak to it at um, more on the transportation focus than just on the Justice 40 initiative side. And this is the same in that same community. Um, taking a look at, so this top one is transportation access. The bottom one is transportation cost burden, and then the last one is traffic safety. And writing to all of those and then including those screenshots. But 
hopefully you have a graphic designer who can put it in a little bit better than I did. So that was the conclusion of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you guys all for the comments and the questions and the discussions. I'm really glad to hear that there are state resources for you as well. And I would definitely encourage you all to uh, take advantage of those as well as some of the other um, tools and websites that I mentioned today. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.